Alat Pimpinel by Baroness Orkazi. Another favorite book of mine. An absolute favorite of mine. It's a book that paints a gruesome picture of the French Revolution. The rank and file hate against anything that was royal. And I, I'm going to read a little from the introduction uh, written by B. Allen Bentley about the book. So, uh, there are some novels whose plots unfold with such a compelling energy, with such irresistibly mounting suspense that they have through the years become characterized by a phrase which, if it has become trite, is nevertheless a testimonial to a work of rare imaginative power. So from its exciting opening with a clattering cart and horse's hooves dinning in his ears as a border guard watches an old hag drive away to freedom with her load of smallpox stricken humanity until its ingeniously tense ending as a scarlet pimpernel wriggles from the bottleneck into which the villain's cleverly dispatched troops have forced him the plot advances in a straight line from one critical situation to another proceeding relentlessly to its culmination in the triumph of the hero indeed there are few books which maintains such a constant and unflagging pressure of suspense and excitement. There are fewer whose plot structure is shaped uh, with such simplicity of line. Baroness Orkazi has confined her characters to the barest essential figures, all of whom have a starkly defined and dramatically active function in the plot centered directly upon the unknown Scarlet Pimpernel himself. He radiates his influence upon every character, upon every situation and event in the book, defining its structure and controlling its space of movement. Focus so intensely upon one dominant figure, all action and all characters merge into one direct advancing line of action. Any subplot that might develop out of the actions of any single person is virtually crushed in the steam-rolling presence of the events that stream from the devious movements of the unpredictable appearances of the Pimpernel. The source of this extraordinary plot power lies in the historical period in which the novel is set, in the enormous popular energy released by the upheaval of the royalist control during the French Revolution, energy which allowed to run riot resulted in senseless carnage, madness and hysteria. By 1792, everything that was beautiful and should have endured in the old order was threatened and with extermination. Along with the avowedly tyrannical and cruel aspects of the regime, clearly developments under the, under the inane impulses of men like Marat and Rospierre whose very essence Baroness Orkazi has caught in the grim and repelling figure of a villain, Chauvelin, were getting wildly out of hand. It was the preservation of the good and goodness, good and the glorious traditions of France that inspired the Scarlet Pimpernel's mad dashes literally into the jaws of death, to the foot of the guillotine, where he rescued the condemned aristocrats and gave them refuge in England. Dickens had, of course, already told the story of a tale of two cities from a point of view 
with which while it did uh, while it did not identify with the bestiality of the mob did nevertheless exalt the fallen cartons and self dispossessed darnies the common and middle classes and did portray a unconditional unconditionally inhuman and cruel the aristocrats against whom the full tide of history had turned baroness ocrazy on the other hand herself a european aristocrat and a member of london society automatically entered the dignity of france uh, ancient regime since the peril that loomed about it tasted the grossness of the unbridled mob that encroached upon it and swept through the dashing and terrifying adventures of the hero who slashed and overturned the conspiracy and the times indeed it is illuminating to examine the tone and plot of the book in the light of the baroness's biography just as every critical episode of the novel emanates from an 18th century drawing room or mansion from lord grenville's ball to the in the foreign office where shovelin first closes in upon his victim to sir percy blankney's country home where margaret first becomes aware of the identity of the scarlet pimpernel so orcrazy's life and critical experiences were centered in the courts and noble homes of hungary france and england born in september 1865 in hungary the only child of baron felix orcrazy she was exposed to all the finer cultural influences of europe so uh, they write about her background and then talking about her descriptions of sir percy blankney's mansion are uh, detailed her recreation of the inside of jellybands in and its warmly gorgeous brasses and oak beams her amazing sense of color texture and movement bring to life with captivating realism a romantic age that the streamlined 20th century has forgotten the music of the age also ripples through the pages gluck's opera orpheus was haunting the courts of germany and england with its revolutionary strains at the very moment when the peasants of paris were storming the bastille and so it is little wonder that in a court centered novel written by a woman of deep sensitivity one of the most striking crucial episodes should be confined within an opera box in covent gardens in the midst of an orpheus's Finally it is not unlikely that in the mind of this romantically sensitive woman there was forged an identification of herself with the heroine of her novel Margaret Blankney the french actress the cleverest brain in europe the stunning creature who sailed over the hearts and hopes of the richer and noblest men and the finest diplomats in the world Although Baroness Ocrazy's life was centered in a world of wealth and privilege it is not to be supposed that life in that world was without its darkness and horror the other side of aristocratic life in 18th century france was a threat of annihilation the hidden deepest movements beneath the lavishly jubilant english society consisted the currents of intrigue the unknown quantity of the scarlet pimpernel and his devout band a devoted band and fear of their imminent capture and death and in the life of the author tragic experiences and insights came 
with the second world war the baroness and her husband lord monte uh barstow were living in monte carlo monte carlo when the nazis invaded france and for the next 5 years the headquarters of the german gestapo were were established in the quarters adjacent to their villa her husband died there in 1943 and their home was bombed by the raf just before the town was liberated what then was a genuine vision of aristocratic suffering and life in a novel became an early parallel to the tragic experiences of its uh titled author although baroness orcasis rare education social success and great personal talents never rose to the full artistic synthesis of great literature they did nevertheless produce immensely popular writings whose themes of romance and adventure are stimulating till the minds of this generation of its author and the scarlet pimpernel and the london times said both have become household words for a grateful multitude in fact for a period of close to 50 years that is 1900 to 1947 she produced most more than 50 books stories and magazine articles now was baroness's like literary range confined to the romantic narrative along with Edgar Allan Poe Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and Agatha Christie she delved into the writing of detective stories three volumes were published of the kind of problem in which the hero solves the most baffling mysteries almost without budging from his armchair these were the old man in the corner its sequel unraveled nosts and the lady molly of scotland yard 1910 and ultimately came her tender and perspective autobiography a links in the chain of life in 1947 the year of her death like robert louis stevenson the baroness or crazy or crazy had the priceless gift of generalizing a private life into the universal terms of humanity of extracting from one's thought emotions and the mundane course of life and rare movements of beauty of sim- synthesizing these into a pattern into literary creations charged with an imaginative dynamism dynamism that carries their readers into a new world of new worlds of adventure romanticism and changeless brightness indeed the new york herald tribune once said of her she has a natural gift for the swift narration or vivid as i was just reading the new york Herald uh, Tribune uh, said that she was a she has a natural gift for swift narration, a vivid imagination, and appropriately flamboyant style. These might themselves be the qualities from which the Baroness forged her super subtle hero in the Scarlet Pimpernel, the champion of perjured aristocracy. So that was the introduction by Alan Bentley, me Alan ben- Bentley. Now I just want to just read maybe a paragraph, uh, a few lines from chapter one. That is Paris, September seventeen ninety two. Chapter one: A surging, seething, murmuring crowd of beings that are human only in name, for to the eye and ear they seem not but savage creatures. animated by wild passions and by the lust of vengeance and of hate the are some little time before sunset and the place the west barricade at the very spot where a decade later a proud tyrant raised an undying 
monument to the nation's glory and his own vanity. During the greater part of the day, the guillotine had been kept busy at its ghastly work. All that France had boasted of in the past centuries of ancient names and the blue blood had paid toll to, their, to her desire for liberty and for fraternity. The carnage had only ceased at this late hour of the day because there were other more interesting sights for the people to witness a, li a little while before the final closing of the barricades for the night. And to the crowd rushed away from the palace uh, and made for the various barricades in order to watch this inter interesting and amusing sight. It was to be seen every day for those aristos were such fools. They were traitors to the people, of course, all of them, men, women and children who happened to be descendants of the great men who since the Crusades had made the glory of France her own noblesse. Their ancestors had, ancestors had oppressed the people, had crushed them under the scarlet heels of their dainty buckled shoes and now the people had become the rulers of France and crushed their former masters not beneath their heels for they went shoeless mostly in the in those days but beneath a more effectual weight the knife of the guillotine and daily Ali the hideous instrument of torture claimed its many victims old men young women tiny children even until the day when it would finally demand the head of the king and of a beautiful young queen but this was it should be were not the people now the rulers of france every aristocrat was a traitor as his ancestor had been before him for 200 years now the people had sweated and toiled and starved to keep a lustful court in lavish extravagance now the descendants of those who would helped who had helped to make those courts brilliant had to hide for their lives, to fly. They wished to avoid the tardy vengeance of the people. And they did try to hide and tried to fly. That was just the fun of the whole thing. Every afternoon before the gates closed and the market carts went out in procession by the various barricades, some fool of an aristo endeavoured to evade the clutches of the Committee of Public Safety. In various disguises, under various pretexts, they tried to slip through the barricades which were so well guarded by citizen soldiers of the Republic. Men in women's clothes, women in male attire, children disguised in beggars' rags. There were some of all sorts. So there were the counts, the marquis, even dukes who wanted to fly from France, reach England or some other equally a cursed country and uh, tr they try to rouse foreign feeling against the glorious revolution or to raise an army in order to liberate the wretched prisoners in the temple who had once called themselves sovereigns of France. But they were nearly always caught at the barricade. Sergeant Bebo, especially at the West Gate, had a wonderful nose for scenting an aristo in the most perfect disguise. Then to then of course the fun began. Bebo would look at his prey as a cat looks upon the mouse, play with him, sometimes for quite a quarter of an hour, pretend to be hoodwinked by the disguise, by the wigs and other bits of theatrical makeup which hid the identity of the noble marquis or count. Oh Bebo had a keen sense of humour and it was well worth hanging round that west barricade in order to see him catch an aristo in the very act of trying to flee from the vengeance of the people. Sometimes Bebo would let his prey actually out by the gates, allowing him to think for the space of two minutes at least that he had escaped out of Paris and might even manage to reach the coast of England in safety. But... Bebo would let the unfortunate wretch walk about 10 meters towards the open country, 
Then he would send two men after him and bring him back stripped of his disguise. Oh, that was extremely funny, for as often as not, the fugitive would prove to, prove to be a woman, some proud uh, nobility who would who looked terribly comical when she found herself in Bebo's clutches after all, and knew that a summary trial would await her the next day, and then, after that, the fond embrace of Madame La Clotty. So it's something like that. It's you, the very fact that you read, you're in it. You want to, you, it's unstoppable. You can hardly put this book down once you start reading it. So this has been, I think I must have read it so many times just for the, uh, the way it's written, the language, the thrill, the suspense. Though there's no suspense for me that I've read it, but still it's so enjoyable. A must read.